Well, good morning. So I want to tell you something for those of you who said, well, I'm not like those people. Here's what I want you to know. It does not take being distracted by a cell phone to miss it, to miss the moments, to miss what God wants you to do in the moment, to miss what God has called you to do in these moments. It doesn't take a cell phone to miss that. It doesn't help. But the disciples, when we look at this chapter, missed it and didn't know they were missing it. Now, I want to say something real quick. I'm going to time out from the message for a second because I want to say something to the people watching. I just want you guys to know, if you're watching at home, that we are doing our best to make it so you can come back to church and be safe. We have UV lights in our uh, uh, air conditioning systems. We actually have a UV light uh, filter on the stage, if you didn't know that. It's one of the reasons I wait a couple minutes after everybody gets off. Um, we uh, spray the church. Uh, we use the same stuff that uh, dentist offices are using to fog their offices. Isn't that awesome? So anyway, uh, but we'd love to have you back. So would you welcome everybody watching online this morning? We're glad you're here either way. <clears throat> we're doing our best to keep you safe, but we love you right where you're at. And uh, um, today we're going to talk about three choices when we choose Jesus. So let me ask you this question. You ever feel like you've lost direction? You ever just feel like you hadn't even really thought about that lately, just blah, you know, maybe that's a good word to describe it. Um, you ever feel like you're not making a difference? Today I want to give you three choices that you can make that will make an eternal difference. And they're from the last week of Jesus' life before the cross. But first I want to tell you a story about when I was distracted. I have plenty of distraction stories, don't I, Dave? I've, I'm like the distraction king. But um, we went, uh, after Jenna graduated from high school, I said, Jenna, you get to choose where you want to go. She said, I want to go to New York City. They were running a special on flights, which was awesome because I thought, I'm going to drive. And flights were like $30. It was crazy. I think we flew with baggage for $60 each round trip. It was craziness. And so we flew to New York City. We stayed two nights in a hotel. Hot wire. And, uh, uh, and then while we were there, I was able to get $10 seats to a Yankees game, which tells you who they were playing. It was probably a Florida team. But anyway, so um, just saying. So, so we were there. We were in seat. We passed goats climbing mountains on the way to our seats. We were so high up that planes, we felt the air as they went. I mean, it was bad, okay? Um, people could parachute from where we were. There were bungee jumpers. Okay, there weren't bungee jumpers. But anyway, so we were up in the thing. But it was awesome. It was awesome. And if you like baseball at all, whether you hate the Yankees or not, by the way, uh, if Patty Romano is watching this morning, I thought of you as I told this Yankees story. So anyway, so as I'm there in the game, Mike, you're a Yankees fan, aren't you? Thumbs up back there from the back. So... Um, we're at the Yankees game is awesome. Uh, you know, just be, spending time with your kids. Baseball is one of those times that you can just sit with somebody and you just kind of talk to them. It's like playing golf or some other thing where you get time to talk. And so we're watching the game, and I think, you know, um, they got those souvenir cups I saw on the way in. I'm going to go get a Coke. And so there was nothing happening in the game, so I left. I went and stood in line, got the Coke. As I was walking back, I heard the most tremendous roar of the crowd. I heard music come on. And of course, as fast as I could, I got back to my seat to where my son, Kyle, looked at me and said, Dad, you missed it. It was awesome. They do fireworks. There were lights everywhere. They play a special song. People, you know, I don't know if there were clowns. I don't know what happened, but, but all kind of things. He just, he made it sound better than I'm sure it was. And I'm like, oh. So we had the Coke, and of course, this was back when you used to share a soda. <laughs> back in the old days, right, when you actually blew out candles on your cake. Anyway, so my mom never has, by the way. So, so I get the Coke, which means about 20 minutes later, I had to leave again. And so, so I leave again. Yeah. As I'm headed back to my seat, I hear <sighs> music play, fireworks go off. I get back to my seat, Kyle's like, you missed it twice, two times. They get a home. Can you leave again so there'll be another home run? You know. Finally, about the eighth inning, there was a home run, and I will tell you, it was really cool. They did all the lights in the stadium. They did fireworks. They had music. People cheered. I think they did the wave. Uh, uh, we bungee jumped off the. No, we didn't do that. But but it was really cool. And I thought I missed that twice for this game, and and I just missed it by. By just for a moment doing something else. Listen, you never know 
the moments that are going to matter in your life. And I'm going to give you a famous theologian's quote. And, and I really think it'll make a difference in your life if you'll remember this quote, this deep theologian. He said, you will never know the value of a moment till the moment passes you by. Dr. Seuss. And so, he's not really a theologian. I don't know if you knew that. but You'll never know the value of a moment till the moment passes you by. See, most of us can remember moments in our lives that, that we remember that were great. Times we connected with somebody. Times we saw something that, that made us in awe or made us grateful or thankful. But we never know when those moments are going to come. And the disciples on the last week of Jesus' life before the cross had no idea. Life is full of moments and choices. There are pivotal moments that you don't know when those moments are going to take place. In each of these moments, you have choices. So here they are. You can choose to be giving and find joy. You can choose to be faithful and find direction and stability. And you can choose to live with purpose and make an eternal difference. So here's number one. Choose giving, not gossip or greed. And we're going to pick up this story here in, uh, in this chapter. Here we go. While he was in Bethany, which, by the way, was two miles from Jerusalem, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper. By the way, if you didn't know, people didn't sit up at tables. They kind of had those, uh, uh, I forgot what they call them. Uh, it's more of a lounge chair kind of thing. And, and you kind of laid sideways and ate. I don't know if you knew that. Feet at the bottom, head at the table. But anyway, so that picture that you saw with everybody on one side of the table, Lord's Supper, not, not real accurate. Um, unless they were taking a selfie. I don't, anyway. So, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. Now, let me give you a couple things here. By the way, I believe, and I have done quite a bit of research on this, I believe there were actually two different anointings of Jesus in two different places. I think both guys' names were Simon, but they were in two different places, and two different women did the anointing. And in this case, this is Mary of Bethany. Now, you know this Mary because this is Mary of Mary and Martha. This sounds like a band, doesn't it? Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, that's the, the, the small family. And so you got Mary and Martha, and just before this, Lazarus had died, and Jesus resurrected Lazarus. Now, I believe that she may have had this, because remember Lazarus was dead for three days? She may have had this to anoint Lazarus. And so she took this whole bottle, a very jar, a very expensive perfume. Perfume that probably came from the Himalayas at that time. Can you imagine the cost of that? By the way, if you're like me and you're curious, what does that smell like? What did that room smell like when she did this? It is, as it says, an earthy pine. Now, I don't know what earthy pine means, but I guess you imagine a pine tree and earth. I don't know. But it said it smells like earthy pine. And so... You can imagine that room suddenly filled with this fragrance. Why? Because she was totally focused on being grateful, on being thankful for Jesus, on seeing who Jesus was. She was willing to sacrifice and give anything to Jesus. She had seen his work. She sat at his feet. She knew that he is God. But what happens next? She broke the jar. She poured the perfume on his head. Some of those presents, present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked her harshly. Now, we know from one of the other Gospels that it was Judas that led the charge, but we know from Mark that Judas was not the only disciple that said this. Because here's what happened. Judas said, oh, how they do, oh, I can't believe they're doing that. And I'm sure some of the other disciples said, yeah, that's right. And that's gossip. It's exactly what gossip is. Gossip is looking at something where God may even be doing something great and looking for the most minute thing that you can complain about and focusing on the complaint instead of the miracle. I do that and you do that. We do it all the time. And God has to work in us to see, I need to be giving instead of gossiping. And then it continues. 
Leave her alone, Jesus said, Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you'll always have with you. You can help them at any time you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Time out. Do you hear what he just said? Would, would the disciples maybe have caught on at that point? She's preparing me for burial. Like, what? Wait, can, can you rewind? Tell us that. But the disciples, once again, just. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she's done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this. And what they do, they promised to give him money. He was looking for a payout. He, he, he wanted a little payback. Now, people talk about and discuss and fight about, uh, just for fun, what Judas' motivation was, and we don't know. But we know he cared about money. Because it says it here. That was, that was part of the thing mentioned. So here you have a woman who's giving everything that she had to Christ. She's sacrificing. She's looking for a way to say, this is how much I love you. And then you've got the disciples you believe that? What a waste. By the way, anytime you do something to be a blessing and do what God wants you to do, did you know there will sometimes be people? Arms crossed. They'll question your motives. They'll question your integrity. They, they might even try to punish you when you try to do what God wants you to do. Guess what? Welcome to the cross. Don't quit doing what God's called you to do just because people gossip about you. Don't do what you're called to do just because people complain about you. Continue to say, God, what do you want me to do in this moment? And look for ways to give. Why? Because when you give, it fights against that selfish, self-centered, greedy gossip that we can all fall into when we allow the world to permeate us. They've actually done studies that people are happier when they give to somebody than when they buy something for themselves. Now, that's a shocker. You wouldn't think that was true. Why? Because when you're buying something, listen, they, you're on Amazon, you're on, let me go old school, you're on Sears. You're looking through the catalog as a kid. You're looking for that perfect toy. And you can imagine what that, that's going to bring to your life. You know, man, if I could just have the battery-powered blower for my yard, I wouldn't have to walk around with the cord. You know, we imagine that and we think that's good. But we've learned that even more satisfying is when we give to others. Choose giving and you'll find joy. Choose giving and you'll find joy. See, when you choose to gossip or when you choose greed, you're, you're going to be dissatisfied always. But when you give for the right purpose, for the right reason... When you choose Jesus in your giving, guess what? You'll find joy. Number two, choose faithfulness, not the flesh. And I'm going to show you uh, what faithfulness looks like. I wanted to bring a whole bag of potato chips. I had just bought a whole bag of potato chips. But by the time I got the potato chips... By the way, I think there's less than there were last night, Dave. I'm just saying, <laughs> Brian, you've been a little too close to this bag. All right. So anyway, these are Kristen's favorite potato chips. My favorite potato chips are barbecue potato chips. That's the reason there is not a bag of barbecue potato chips up here for two reasons. Number one, I eat the whole bag. Number two, I don't not buy them for myself. And don't you dare go buy me some barbecue potato chips again. Let me tell you something about, bar about potato chips. You could eat this whole bag of potato chips today. And not gain a pound. You could. Absolutely you could. You could eat this apple instead today and gain weight. But what matters is what you do over time. Every choice you make in life is like the difference between choosing potato chips or choosing an apple. Choosing something that maybe feels satisfying but you know it's not right. It's the flesh 
or choosing something more difficult sometimes, choosing the Spirit and let God bring life to you. Every word you say is a choice. You ever feel like being grumpy about something? You can choose to gossip. Or you can choose to say like my mom does all the time, bless their heart, you know. When you're faithful in habits that no one sees, it's easier to be faithful when life gets tough. When you're faithful in spending time every day in God's word, when you're faithful in spending time in prayer, it will change you. Now, I skipped over the Lord's Supper today. I skipped over a couple of verses. I'm actually, for the first time in this series, going to come back to this chapter next week. So fear not. Now, this happened on Thursday night. They went to a place called Gethsemane. Now, remember, they had the Lord's Supper. You know, probably are familiar with that story. And now they go to Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John along with him. And he began to be dis deeply distressed and troubled. In the Greek, it, it, it's the idea he was horrified. And dismayed. I believe that Jesus knew he was going to the cross and he was seeing, just like you see something ahead of time, when you go to do something or you have to deal with something, you see it ahead of time. Jesus knew what the cost was for forgiveness, for salvation, for you, for me to have a relationship with us. He said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. And he said to them, stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed. That if it's possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, which means Daddy. He said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet, not what I will, but what you will. What is Jesus saying? I don't want to go to the cross. Is there another way? But God, even if there's no other way, not what I will, but what you will. I want to encourage you when you pray. There are times that you need to say that same thing. God, I would love you to answer my prayer the way I want. God, I'd love you to heal this person, but your will. God, I would love not to deal with this issue in my life. I would love my children to wake up in the morning and go, Father, we have cleaned our room. We went ahead and took out the garbage. We mowed the yard for you because we love you. Hello, Father, the dishes are washed. But not my will. What do I do? Daily disciplines. How can I encourage my children? How can I bless my children? How can I help them to have the habits that I want them to have? God, help me to do your will. In the middle of people who don't. In the middle of people who don't, you have to do his will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, by the way, remember he had changed Peter's name. And he comes back and says, Simon, again. Basically, you're not acting like the rock. That I called you. Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing. But the flesh is weak. The spirit is willing. You, you know what you should do. You know what's right. You know what. But the flesh is weak. What? So you have to lean on his spirit. That's the thing about being a Christian. We have his spirit. Once, once more, he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. Some of you to this morning are filling that prophecy right there. <laughs> they did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. See, when you become a Christian, the Bible says you have a whole new righteousness that you inherit. And so people say, well, if that's true, then why do I struggle with old habits? Why do I struggle with sin? Because old habits. Old habits hang on, even though you have a new life in Christ. Even though you know what it means to walk in the Spirit. Even though you know when you drive how you should respond to people who cut you off. So we say, God, would you change me? One of the things I want to encourage you to do is think of a specific conflict you have. A specific issue. Maybe it's with one of your children. Maybe it's with a grandchild. Maybe it's with a neighbor. Maybe it's with a co-worker at work. And maybe in the past, those have not gone well. So begin to say, God, would you help me to do your will when I speak to them? Even if what they do is not right, help me to do what's right 
Even if what they do is over here, I'm not partaking of the potato chips with them. Lord, help me to say what's right. Help me to speak the truth in love. So much fun to speak the truth, isn't it? But Jesus always spoke the truth in love. Imagine yourself coming before God. So often when I'm dealing with a difficult situation, I imagine myself taking a person or a situation before God and going, God, I've been carrying this. Would you take this situation? God, would you help me the next time this happens? And it'll happen again. By the way, God gives retakes. Did you know that? He never fails you. He just gives you a retake. So you surrender it to him. You choose giving, you find joy. You choose faithfulness, and you'll find direction and stability. What does that look like? God, your will be done today. Number three, choose purpose, not power. The world loves power, loves control. Life is about control. And they are making us addicted to our devices and getting us more addicted through Facebook and Twitter and all these other things, even television. We love the remote, don't we? I mean, most of us haven't watched a commercial in years all the way through. Unless the remote breaks, then we're just too lazy to get up and change the channel, right? By the way, I was the remote as a kid. Most of us were, right? Sometimes I was the antenna. Were you ever the antenna? <laughs> the world is all about power and control. Be careful that as a Christian, you don't fall into, I need power and control. Because power and control means that we're putting ourselves above God. Let me, let me give you an example from my life. I noticed this week, I've actually noticed the last few weeks, that every time I stop at a stoplight, I go like this. <sighs> every time. Now, I drive about six or seven, well, that's more than that. I think I drive about 12 hours a week, okay? I have to drive to Orlando and back, downtown quite a bit, and back. There's a couple of lights between here and there. Did you know that? By the way, there used to only be one light between my house and the church. They just keep putting them in. Why? God's giving me retakes. Right? So this week I was thinking about that habit, that habit of basically cursing every time. And I said, Lord, I'm going to start when I stop at a light going, thank you, Lord, for a car. Thank you, Lord, for these moments. Because I don't want the people in my car, my wife, my children, my friends to think, man, that Eric all the time, he's just frustrated all the time when he was driving. I would love it if they got in the car with me and they're like, you know, it was so encouraging. Every time he stopped, he was like, praise the Lord. By the way, last night and this morning, four lights out here, all greens. Couldn't, couldn't catch one. I'm like, I can't even live this sermon out yet. God's like, we're just going to let you go now that you're learning the lesson. Two, two days in a row. I'm going to catch everyone on the way home. It's going to be. Now, the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. By the way, in the Greek, this is an intense kiss. It made it extra disgusting. He was doing it as a show. So it was like a spiteful kiss, which just makes it even more egregious. You hear that and you're just like, ah. Oh. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. The one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Now we know from the other gospel that, number one, it was Peter. By the way, if Peter had been arrested, it probably would have been his head. But anyway. And then Jesus picks up the ear and puts it back on. By the way, two things happen when they come and ask if it's Jesus. When they come up, he says, I am. And they fall backwards. I mean, it was like a charismatic revival. They were just all like, whoa, when the Jesus said it was me. All right. You think at that point, some of the guards would have been like, you know. And if they didn't get that one, don't you think when they saw the dude's ear on the ground and Jesus went. By the way, there's several places in the Bible where it says Jesus spit on people. Did you ever really think about that? What that was like? So I'm just thinking he went. Don't you think that guy would be like, can I go home? But that wasn't it, see? Even Peter thought it was about power, which you don't blame him. Jesus said, bring a sword. You're like, well, I know what a sword's for. But then he continues, am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you've come with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. Now, Jesus gets back to the most important thing. Listen, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone 
deserted him, and fled. Jesus said, I know what my purpose is. You want to make it about power and control. The disciples even wanted to make it about a kingdom that they got to be part of. Remember up front? I want to be on your right and left when we get to rule this Jerusalem. Man, look at these great stones. We're going to get, this is going to be our temple. It's not going to be long now. And Jesus is like, no. I'm following what God wants me to do. Let me ask you a question. Are you seeking his power or your power in your life? Are you more concerned about controlling others or allowing God to use you and fulfilling his purpose for you? Life is full of moments and choices. There's pivotal moments, and we don't know when they're going to take place. Maybe today as you're talking to somebody, you are able to share with them about what God's done in your life, and you may change their life for eternity. One of the guys that was here in church last night, years ago, was was visiting with a friend who was a Christian. He was not a Christian. He was top of the world. And his friend said to him one day something about his purpose. And so he decided one day, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to drive over to First Baptist Church of Merritt Island just to see what's going on. And one night he went there and Peter Lord was speaking. And that night he gave his life to Christ. You never know when something you say to somebody will be the very thing that God uses in that moment to change them. In each of these moments, you have choices. I want to encourage you, choose to be giving like Jesus and find joy. Choose to be faithful and find direction and stability. And choose to live with purpose and make an eternal difference. Eight years ago yesterday, I was on the side of the road, broken down. All of a sudden, I heard a familiar voice from my childhood say, Eric Brookins, is that you? I looked over, and a friend I had not seen since 12th grade was in his car, truck, Right there. He was headed to the Space Center to build the new Subway restaurant that many of you get to enjoy. He was headed there. He happened to leave early. And he happened to look up and see his old friend from high school. And he went and got me a battery. We got a battery in my car. Got my car running. And we became friends again. We reconnected. We talked on the phone. We went to a couple of magic games together. We went to eat several times. We got to talk on occasion That moment mattered, and he was paying attention and took advantage of that moment. Almost two years ago now, that very friend was in a car accident that took his life. I'm so thankful for the day that he looked over and said, Eric Brookins, can I help you? You never know what the moments bring today. And you can choose to be fleshly and do your own thing, Or you can choose through his spirit to say, God, make me sensitive. Help me to look for what you want today. Help me not fall into the potato chips of the world, the flesh. But Lord, help me look for what you desire today. If you're here today or you're watching online and you've never given your life to Christ, you can do that today. Today you can surrender your life to him. That's what it means to be a Christian. is to say, Jesus, I know you died on a cross. I know you rose again. And you can forgive my sins because you paid that debt. And so, Father, I choose to surrender my heart and my life to you. If you want to do that today, I'd love to talk to you about what it means. A prayer is just an attitude of the heart that you make. If you're here today and the truth is, as I talk to you, realize there's a lot of potato chips in your life. There's a lot of times that you choose the flesh. Hey, just confess it to God. And tell him today, Lord, would you help me to take advantage of the moments? To choose Jesus in the moments. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this moment. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for each, folk, each person here that serves, that goes out of their way to sacrifice for others. And Lord, if we're honest, sometimes we're just busy. Sometimes we don't think a whole lot about your spirit. And so, Father, right now, we just choose Lord, we choose to lay aside our flesh, our way of thinking, our control, our power, our gossip, our greed. We lay all of those things at your feet. And Lord, right now, we give our hearts and our lives to you. Lord, I pray as a church, we would be a church that always looks for ways to give to others and to give to you, to show your love to this world. Father, I pray today we would be very sensitive to the moments because we love you. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a great song.